Kia ora koutou. Greetings, my name is Dean Knight, I'm one of the directors of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law and on behalf of the centre um, I'd like to welcome you to our discussion of Brexit in the Supreme Court, uh, Miller against the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, what a mouthful, and it's really a delight to see so many people here in the audience to uh, uh, help us discuss and unpack that decision. So 11 judges, by my count 58 lawyers, wall-to-wall -wall media coverage and now a 97-page judgment. Um, but sadly, perhaps absent any repeat citation of our big constitutional case, Fitzgerald and Muldoon, which was seen in the Divisional Court's uh, judgment. So as you know, to help unpick uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Miller, we're joined by two of Victoria's uh, experts. First, Campbell McLaughlin QC from the Faculty of Law, well known to most of you in the audience, a leading authority on international law, both as a scholar and in practice, and notably author of the weighty foreign relations text, um, a tome that was quoted with approval in the Supreme Court's majority judgment. And he'll kick off with an analysis of the ruling and its reasoning. Secondly, Dr Fiona Barker from the School of History, Philosophy, Political Science and International Relations, an expert in comparative politics, with scholarship, amongst other things, uh, focusing on Europe and its multinational dynamics. And she'll uh, follow um, uh, Campbell McLaughlin with uh, uh, some insights into the broader implications of the decision, trying to place it in its in its context. And then following those remarks, there should be an opportunity for questions and discussion. So please join with me in welcoming Campbell and then Fiona. Well, thank you very much. It's a delight to see so many of you here. Happy New Year to you all. Um, the judgment of the United Kingdom Supreme Court in Miller and the Secretary of State, the Brexit appeal, is the most significant decision on the shape of British constitutional law in at least a generation. In fact, it's difficult to think of any decision of equal significance since the great constitutional struggles of the 17th century, the case of proclamations and the Glorious Revolution. In a judgment delivered by the President, Lord Newburgh, an overwhelming majority of the full court, eight to three, with Lords Reid, Carnworth and Hughes dissenting, the Supreme Court affirmed the judgment of the Divisional Court holding that the government may not give notice to withdraw from the European Union without the authority of an Act of Parliament. The judgment states the legal reasons for this so clearly that it is easy to underrate what was at risk in the dispute and its significance. In making a preliminary assessment of this just 48 hours later, today I'd like to do five things, five short things. Firstly, to unpack what the case was actually about and what the judgment decides. Secondly, to try to contextualise the wider legal controversy as it shaped in the seven months between the referendum on the 23rd of June last and the judgment on the 23rd of January this year. Thirdly, to examine the importance of the judgment for the reshaping of law in the United Kingdom. But fourthly, to argue that I th in my uh, view this judgment has a much wider significance here as well as there for the real reasons why we maintain the sovereignty of Parliament over the prerogatives of the executive government in the Westminster system of representative democracy. And finally and fifthly, to explore with the benefit of my colleague Dr Fiona Barker and in discussion with you the possible downstream implications. So turning first to the judgment itself. <clears throat> Although the arguments ranged very widely, the core issue posed for the court in the Brexit appeal was narrow. Article 50, paragraph 1 of the European Union Treaty provides that, quotes, any member state may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. Having made such a decision, the member state must notify the European Council of its intention, following which the Union is to negotiate and conclude an agreement on the terms of withdrawal. However, Article 50, Paragraph 3 specifically provides that the EU treaties, quotes, shall cease to apply to the state in question two years after notification by the relevant state if no withdrawal agreement has been concluded in the meantime. So this case 
was about determining what the UK's constitutional requirements for such a decision to withdraw are. Was the government entitled to give a notice to withdraw of its own motion in the exercise of the Foreign Affairs Treaty prerogative, on the one hand, or did it have to obtain prior authorization from Parliament by statute? Those were the choices. There was and is no dispute that the making and unmaking of treaties is a matter of foreign relations within the competence of the government as an exercise of the prerogative. So if the unmaking of the European Union treaties had effect only on the international plane, then Gina Miller and the other claimants would not have had an arguable case. But European Union law has a unique place in, as part of the domestic law of the member states, including in British law. Those provisions of European law from time to time created or arising under the treaties, as in accordance with the treaties are without further enactment to be given legal effect or used in the United Kingdom, are by virtue of Parliament's enactment of Section 2, Paragraph 1 of the European Communities Act 1972, part of United Kingdom law. And they shall be recognised and available in law, and I'm here quoting from the statute, and be enforced, followed and allowed accordingly. So they're as much a part of United Kingdom law as the Magna Carta, Donoghue and Stevenson, or the Road Traffic Acts. So the applicants maintained that since European law would inevitably cease to apply in the United Kingdom two years after the government's notification of withdrawal, it being accepted on all sides that such a notice is irrevocable, parenthetically not an incontestable proposition, but one which the government held to uh, at appeal, the result of such a notice would be to change the law, said the applicants, something that only Parliament can do. In response, the government argued, firstly, because the 1972 Act applied to provisions from time to time created under the treaties, Parliament had legislated no fixed content of U European law into UK law. On the, con on the contrary, said the government, either the European institutions themselves or the British government in the exercise of its prerogative could enlarge or reduce the EU rights directly in effect in the United Kingdom, including, if the government so decided, reducing them to naught as a result of withdrawal. In any event, in the second strand of the government's argument, uh, it was submitted that it did have the power to use its foreign affairs prerogative to change domestic law and could use it in this context. In addition to that core dispute, there were also a set of arguments raised by the applicants from Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales that the inevitable changes in British law that would result uh, from uh, withdrawal from the Union required the government to make prior consultations with the devolved legislatures because it was said devolution always assumed continued membership of the Union. And of course in Northern Ireland that argument had a particular purchase uh, because of the delicate intercommunal balance achieved in the province underpinned by the agreement with the Republic of Ireland, it was said that only membership of the Union on both sides of that border made those arrangements possible. And again, in relation to the uh, devolution arguments in both Scotland and Northern Ireland, of course, a majority of the people in both <coughs> parts of the United Kingdom had voted to remain. So what happened in the Supreme Court? Well, the Supreme Court rejected both of the government's defences to the claim and upheld the applicant's position that parliamentary approval was required statutory approval was required. So the court held firstly that the rights given effect under the European Union treaties are by virtue of the 1972 Act not capable of being taken away without parliamentary approval and they reasoned that in the following steps. Firstly they said the Act did two things. It provided that rights derived from European Union law should apply in the United Kingdom as part of its domestic law. And secondly, it provided a new constitutional process for making law in the United Kingdom. This was not, thought the court, a mere exercise in delegated legislation. It was an actual transfer of lawmaking powers by Parliament to the European Union institutions in 1972 for so long as Parliament willed it. Then they said that Parliament's endorsement of the UK's membership of the, Un of the Union in 1972 is inconsistent with the future exercise by ministers of the power to withdraw without statutory approval. What was done by Parliament could not be undone by ministers. 
nor could the government take away domestic rights acquired by individuals in the UK through the same route without parliamentary sanction. So that was limb one of the government's argument, the effect of the 1972 Act. On the second point, the proposition that you could use the Foreign Affairs Treaty prerogative to change the law of the land, again the court said no. They held that it's a fundamental principle of the Constitution that unless primary legislation permits it, the prerogative does not enable ministers to change statute law or the common law, and nor, can, they said, can the government frustrate the purpose of a statute by emptying it of content or preventing its effectual operation. The exercise, they said, of the prerogative power to make or unmake treaties is only defensible on the basis that treaties only operate on the plane of international law and are not part of UK law. So once that core issue had been resolved, the Supreme Court rejected the devolution arguments holding that the devolved legislatures did not have a parallel legislative competence uh, regarding withdrawal from international treaties to that of Westminster Parliament and that constitutional conventions as to consultation with them were unenforceable uh, at law. And I think Fiona's going to say a few more words about that aspect later on. Um, and finally, on the referendum itself, the court said that the, the referendum is of, quotes, great political significance, but, quotes, whereas in this case implementation of a referendum result requires a change in the law of the land, and statute is not provided for that change, the change in the law must be made in the only way which the UK Constitution permits, namely through parliamentary legislation. So that's 90 pages in nine minutes. <laughs> in assessing the significance of the judgment, it's necessary to wind back a moment and place the judgment in the context in which it arose. And that's what I want to do in uh, my second part of my lecture. So on the 23rd of June last, the United Kingdom EU membership referendum returned a result of 51.9% 51 of the electorate in favour of leaving with 48.1% wishing to remain. Almost immediately after the result of the referendum, the British government took the position that it was entitled to give notice of withdrawal in the exercise of the prerogative and didn't need statutory authority from Parliament. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said that in Parliament in the Commons on the 11th of J July 2016, and when uh, appointed as Prime Minister, Theresa May was increasingly insistent on that point. Well, Parliament itself didn't rise to, the, to this challenge, but Gina Miller and a number of individual claimants did. And that's an interesting point in itself, isn't it? From inception, the litigation was not, or not simply, about the courts forcing an unwilling parliament to take an initiative, it was instead about something much closer to the core role of the judiciary in the Westminster Constitution, namely the protection of individual rights from the abuse of state power. Because European Union law, especially the parts that have direct effect, is not just a web of oppressive regulations about how long cucumbers are allowed to be, as the British press would like to have it, uh, it gives individuals rights, very important rights, such as the freedom of movement and establishment, which are given directly under the treaties and which will be lost upon withdrawal. This was a decisive consideration for the Divisional Court at first instance in its unanimous judgment on the 3rd of November of 2016. It thought that such rights couldn't be taken away without an Act of Parliament. But despite this, the press rushed to brand the divisional court, quotes, enemies of the people, according to the Daily Mail. The Sun asked, who do you think you are? <laughs> Even the Daily Telegraph branded the result, the judges versus the people. But of rather more serious concern I want to submit today was the reaction of a number of senior academic lawyers, mainly in Oxford. The attack was immediate, orchestrated in part through a... a um, research project called the Judicial Power Project, and rapidly evolved, as the Supreme Court notes in its judgment, in prox into proxy litigation by blog uh, in the balance of 2016. A major part of this attack was to go on the offensive and argue that the government of the day could use the foreign affairs prerogative to alter the rights of citizens on the domestic plane. Professor John Finnis, Emeritus Professor of Jurisprudence at Oxford, argued in the Sir Thomas More lecture on the 1st of December that Parliament had sanctioned this in the 72 Act and also in other statutes. He was particularly keen on double tax statutes for those of you who are aficionados of that area. 
Um, Professor Timothy Endicott, who is, professor, is currently Professor of Jurisprudence at Oxford, argued both in London on the 1st of December and indeed here in the same terms in his Cook Lecture on the 15th of December that, quotes, it is a fallacy to say that if Parliament's enacted a statute giving effect to rights arising under a treaty, the government cannot take action that would terminate those rights. And Professor David Feldman, Rouse Brawl Professor of English Law in Cambridge, argued that, quotes, the claim that the prerogative cannot be used to deprive people of rights, either absolutely or conditionally, is untenable, untenable as a matter of law. Well, these arguments were taken up with alacrity and cited in the government's submissions before the Supreme Court. Most of the footnotes refer to blog posts. For that reason, I, for reasons that I developed in writing more, uh, in more detail elsewhere in my first entry ever into the blogosphere, um, in my view, they sought to recharacterize or simply bluntly to misconstrue settled authority going back to the 17th century. And they were rightly rejected by the Supreme Court. Well, why should we care about all of this? In my third point is that it matters greatly this judgment matters greatly for two reasons, one specific to the UK and a second of much wider significance to all states governed by the rule of law and especially those like New Zealand with a Westminster-style constitution. The more specific ground on which the court decided the case, the construction of the 72 Act, is significant because it shows the court really and ironically finally only at the end of Britain's uh, engagement with the Union coming to grips with the true nature of European Union law within the British legal system and the enormity of the consequences of withdrawal on the reshaping of that legal system. The court says that in constitutional uh, terms the effect of the 1972 Act was unprecedented since it authorises a dynamic process by which European law is received into the British legal system. Uh, it refuses to allow the significance of this to be cut down by analogy with delegated le legislation, still less double tax treaties, pointing out that, quotes, one of the most fundamental functions of the constitution of any state is to identify the sources of its law, and that European law had become a whole third source of law in the British legal system. The change, of course, caused by withdrawal will be seismic. The former Treasury solicitor, Sir Paul Jenkins, described it as, quote, the largest legal, legislative and bureaucratic project in British history outside a world war. If I take uh, another area which is of some interest to me, private international law, Dicey's other great contribution to English law, um, the whole network of private law relations across Europe and indeed common European law rules for such interactions globally have been transformed in the past 30 years by European law. I would say two-thirds of Dicey and Morris on the conflict of laws is now European law. And there is a, then a question of what is going to be put in place of that uh, were the United Kingdom to withdraw. So this process has to be controlled by Parliament. It can't be left to an ex post facto great repeal bill on the dictated terms of the government once a deal has already been done. But what of its signif the significance of this judgment more generally, including for us here as well as there? Well, I say that the rule that only Parliament and not the executive government can determine the rule of the, the law of the land does two basic things for us. Firstly, it protects ordinary people against the arbitrary exercise of executive power, which is a basic function, after all, of the rule of law. And secondly, it ensures that only our democratically elected representatives in Parliament can change the law, a basic tenet of representative democracy. Those that argued in favour of Brexit in the United Kingdom often cast their arguments in terms of taking back control of the British Constitution from those nasty bureaucrats in Brussels. But these are, these principles that I've just enunciated, are the very principles that are at the core of that Constitution. And we should reflect on the fact that those basic rights were actually hard fought. They were hard physically fought because it took a civil war in Britain in the 17th century and a revolution in 1688 to cement them into the Bill of Rights, 1688, which is as much a part of the New Zealand Constitution as it is of the British one, which and which confirmed, amongst other things, that the king could neither suspend nor abrogate the law. As Lord Hoffman put it, the rule that treaties can't alter the law of the land is but one facet of the more general principle that the Crown cannot change the law by ex exercise of its powers under the prerogative. This was the great principle which was settled by the Civil War and the Glorious Revolution in the 17th century. 
And we know here in New Zealand that, that principle is important precisely because, as Dean has already mentioned, we've had the case of Fitzgerald and Muldoon in which we precisely had uh, a Prime Minister purporting to act to suspend the law without the authority of Parliament and in which the courts had to indicate that, that was not in accordance with our Constitution. So if here we are to continue to depend upon an unwritten constitution, as in Britain, it's vital that we maintain a shared understanding of its core principles. And the Supreme Court judgment is significant for its unqualified and unwavering affirmation of this principle. So why then? Why is it so important that it should be specifically Parliament and only Parliament that has the final say on the law of the land? I think it is actually important now to articulate an answer to this because parliaments have themselves garnered a bit of a bad name recently, haven't they? They're often fractious and riven with dissent. They've been mired in the UK in scandal. Who could forget the scandal of Douglas Hogg claiming the cost of cleaning his moat on parliamentary expenses? And in the case of Brexit, more significantly, the people themselves had spoken through a referendum. This was a very important expression of direct popular democracy for which there are a few precedents in the British Constitution apart from the entry and exit from the EU and devolution or the voting system itself. And of course, Theresa May's government wasn't shy in clothing their statements justifying the use of the prerogative uh, to withdraw by reference to the direct mandate which they claimed they'd received from the people by reason of the referendum. Well, I thought that the um, author, Tom McCarthy, put this rather well in The Guardian on Saturday, citing an example from the birthplace of democracy, ancient Greece, the trial of Orestes, that the goddess Athena ordered instead of allowing the Furies to exact retribution of them in Aeschylus' Aristea. McCarthy writes, democracy is structural. The legal mandate for Orestes' verdict comes not from, for example, the Furies whipping up hatred of him among the general Athenian populace, even if they might have won over a majority by so doing. If civil justice worked like that, then William Golding's The Lord of the Flies would be taught in schools as a positive illustration of people power. <laughs> Democracy takes place when civic institutions uphold due process. The answer given by a majority of the people of Britain to the question posed to them by Act of Parliament, the EU Referendum Act 2015, remain or leave the EU was whether we disagree with the result or not, a defining decision of the British people, an important expression of what my colleague Joel Colin Rios would call constituent power. But, that the, but the answer that they gave was an answer to Parliament. We simply cannot allow the people's answer to a general question of this kind to serve as a cloak for the exercise of executive power, especially when it affects the right of individuals. That would be a very dangerous precedent indeed. We don't need to look too far back in history to see the effect of the subversion of institutions of the state by executive power claiming a generalized authority of the people. We have built up our institutions of government, our balance of the three organs of government over 350 years, especially in these times when demagogues are on the rise again in Western democracies. It's important to speak out for why the institutions and processes of constitutional government are important. Only Parliament, our deliberative institution at the heart of the structure of our democracy, can shape the law of the land. It is, as Lord Diplock said, 350 years and a civil war too late for the Queen's courts to broaden the prerogative. Thank you. Hello, and I'll come back to um, Campbell's last points on thinking about the referendum towards the end of my comments. What I wanted to do um, is situate some of the issues that have come out of the court case in perhaps the broader political context and also thinking about the, um, in particular, the case around devolution, so the multi-level polity that is the United Kingdom. Um, so I'll make comments around three, three main issues, um, one around that devolution context um, and the, the ways in which the ruling perhaps shows some of the weaknesses or the limitations of the devolution settlement in the United Kingdom. Second, um, some points which are necessarily speculative given that this is a day and a half old um, in terms of the party politics 
of what will happen next and the debates that will be going on. And then coming back to the, the issue of the utility of a, of a referendum for these types of questions and in the, the social political context that we, we find ourselves. Now, as um, Campbell already mentioned, the Sewell Convention was one that, um, a political convention that was uh, referred to that came up a lot in the in this Article 50 case, and it was in relation to the question of whether um, the devolved parliaments would need to be consulted and whether they would need to authorise, essentially, or give assent, consent to um, any legislation to, or the, to enacting Brexit. Um, now, many of you will know a little bit about the Sewell Convention. It comes out of the Scotland Act. Um, so in the Scotland Act, it was stated that very clearly that the UK retains the right to legislate on devolved matters, which is quite an important point because it marks the UK in the Scottish case of devolution out from many other multi-level polities um, that are much more in, in the, down the continuum to federalism. Um, so that's an important point. Nonetheless, it was also stated just after that in the Scotland Act that Westminster will not normally legislate on devolved matters or matters that would alter the legislative or executive competencies of the devolved, par devolved parliament without their consent. So that was the case of, is, is this a, one of those moments of affecting um, devolved competencies or legislating on devolved matters whereby we would need the consent of the, of the devolved parliaments? And there's a memorandum of understanding that was enacted in 2001, so three years after devolution, which enacted that, this convention, which came to be known as the Sewell Convention after Lord Sewell. Now, in the court case, I'll just outline a little bit what the case was made by the Lord Advocate, so who was arguing the case um, in the interests of, of Scotland, of why the Sewell Convention, so political convention, should apply in this case. And he pointed out first that the Scotland Acts, they make the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, a permanent part of the UK constitutional framework. And also that all of the political guidance notes, or what are called the devolution guidance notes, state very clearly that the convention applies whenever legislation makes provisions for a devolved purpose. So that goes back into that thing of where Westminster would be legislating in an area that's really a devolved competency. And the Lord Advocate made, made the claim or made the argument that even if we accept that the Brexit legislation does re relate to a reserved matter, that is the around foreign affairs, treaty making, that Brexit would substantially impact on devolved areas of competence and that it would also alter the legislative and executive competence, so that of the Scottish Parliament and of the Scottish Executive, by disabling a lot of references to EU law um, within the Scotland Act. Therefore, he contended that um, the Sewell Convention should apply, the Scottish Parliament should be consulted, and a legislative consent motion would be needed. And that's the motion that the Scottish Parliament passes in order to give its consent when Westminster is legislating in its area of, of competence. So he was there, thereby also saying that the Sewell Convention would fall under the, the constitutional requirements that are referred to in Article 50 of the, the European treaties, so that according, a, a, a state can withdraw according to its constitutional requirements. He was saying, well, the co Convention is, in this case, indeed one of the constitutional requirements. He also made the point that since devolution, so since 1998, Westminster has consistently consulted um, and sought legislative consent motions on all matters relating to um, devolved competence. So he said that the, the Sewell Convention has never knowingly been breached, and he produced a, a very large schedule of citing every, every instance since devolution when um, when legislative con consent motions have been sought and have been granted. So essentially showing that the, there's no occasion where this, the convention, the civil convention, has not been applied. Now, as we know, the, the Supreme Court didn't accept that, that argument. They unanimously decided that the, um, there was no legal compulsion to consult the devolved governments before triggering Article 50. 
They said the Devolution Act, so in this case Scotland, but also um, Welsh, Northern Ireland, they were passed on the assumption that the UK would be a member of the European Union, but didn't go any further and require the, U the UK to remain a part of the, of the EU. And then they focused on the fact that this is a political convention. It's not a legal obligation, it's a convention, which raises issues, of course, around at what point does something that, that is a convention become a, um, a deeper part of the constitutional fabric. They pointed out that conventions are not enforceable in the courts of law and noted that as judges, they are, quote, neither the parents nor the guardians of political conventions. They are merely observers. So this has quite a lot of implications for Scotland. And Nicola Sturgeon, as the First Minister of Scotland, has been quick to jump on, um, jump on this point and to say that, well, all of the claims, and I'm quoting about Scotland being an equal partner, um, are being exposed as nothing more than empty rhetoric and the very foundations of the de devolution settlement are being shown to be worthless. So there's a, a rhetorical flourish saying, well, the, it really shows the weaknesses of what was seen in the Seoul Convention to be quite an important plank of, of devolution that Scottish Parliament was created, that Westminster would not um, encroach on its, on its turf, legislate on, on devolved competencies unless it had the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And it, it also shows us quite nicely in comparative terms, so thinking across, um, across advanced democracies with multinational or multi-level polities, just how weak devolution in the, U, in the United Kingdom then is. Um, where it's, if the Seoul Convention is, seen to, is able to be brushed aside quite so easily, um, that it doesn't give a lot of strong institutional power to to that devolved parliament. Now, in the last day or so, they've discussed, um, Nicola Sturgeon has said, well, holy root, so the Scottish Parliament will pass a motion anyway, will pass a legislative consent motion in a symbolic manner, even though it's not necessary. That's now um, under some contention because it's not clear if that's actually legal for them to do so, but they've now said they will pass a motion rejecting Article 50 in any case. So there's a lot of um, discussions within the Scottish Parliament going on about how do they react to this to try and show the, their rejection of the, the position around Article 50. That's the institutional side of things. It also shows us, and Campbell also mentioned this before, the issues around legitimacy. When um, Scotland voted 62% to remain in, in the EU compared yeah, 62% um, to remain compared to the 52% leave um, in the UK. All of the Scottish National Party MPs have said they'll vote against the Article 50 legislation. At the, in the current legislative period from Scotland, there's one sole Conservative MP um, and one sole Labour MP. So there's 54 Scottish National Party MPs the representation of um, the other parties, so the Tories and, the, and Labour, is, is exceedingly low. The Labour MP from Edinburgh North is representing a constituency that voted around 74% to remain. Um, this, the Conservative MP from Dumfrieshire and associated areas um, is also representing an area that, that voted 58% to remain, and that was one of the lower remain votes in, in Scotland. And even in the borders, which is um, around there, it was around 53%. So even the, the Conservative MP there's, will be one of those in this position of following the party line but voting against the, um, the clear vote to remain in Scotland. So there's, um, MPs are in a difficult position, but more generally we do face that prospect that another major constitutional change will occur without majority support from the devolved nation. So if we're thinking of the UK in terms of the, its component parts, um, which obviously harks back to um, Thatcher days as well in terms of the ways in which Scotland was, um, and especially in, in political and historical narrative within Scotland about how Scotland was treated. So that raises the question of whether this pushes us a little bit further towards another independence referendum in Scotland. Um, 
Nicola Sturgeon has said she reserves the right to put that to the people. She's certainly utilising the opportunity or the, the situation to discuss that a bit more. But if we look at the, last, the latest polls, so polls taken um, after the, since the EU referendum, there's not much movement in any case back towards, towards a support for majority support for independence among the Scottish people. So despite the very clear um, will of the Scottish people to remain in the EU, that doesn't translate into, after, brekfa, uh, breakfast, after Brexit, um, into a switch um, back towards um, a vote for independence because of, because of Brexit. So in, in late 2016, when forced to make a choice, around 47% were saying they support independence for Scotland, and that compares to 44% at the time of the independence referendum in 2014. So there's some movement, but not, not a whole lot, and not any, to any degree that we would really expect an independence referendum to now pass. So perhaps the better strategy would be to try and get more out of negotiations, out of Brexit negotiations, to take this as a moment to get further devolved competencies, to change in some way the nature of the, um, the Union of States, as um, some people call it. So that would be one solution, but already many of the areas in which Scotland has been trying to get further devolved powers, um, the UK has pushed back on very severely, such as immigration, which even in the last two days, um, the Home Secretary clearly ruled out further demands by Scotland or requests to have a little more competency to have regional variation in immigration policy making. So it's not clear um, whether coming out of um, the UK government there would be any flexibility around the further devolved competencies. Added to that is that the Scottish, the SNP government in Scotland at the moment is a minority government. They're struggling to pass their own budget. So they're not in a very strong um, political position either which makes the, um, the comments around pushing for another ind independence referendum a little bit hollow. They're not, they're not in a strong position. So moving from the Scottish situation, just to think a little bit about the broader party politics of it. Already since, um, since the ruling, we've had um, a lot of demands for a white paper, and overnight, sort of in the last... Um, few hours. Theresa May has made the concession that she will, they will publish a white paper on Brexit. A lot, of, a lot of people are saying they'll table amendments, so attach amendments to the Article 50 legislation around the nature of the vote that Parliament would pass on the final deal, um, sub substantive points around the rights of workers, demanding impact uh, um, assessments, these types of things. When it comes down to voting for the legislation, we need to think in particular, I think about the Labour Party because they're in a particular bind. If we look at the way their uh, members voted, so the MPs' positions in terms of Brexit, the, of 228 MP, Labour MPs who declared their position before the EU referendum, 218 of them vote, were intending to vote Remain. But now the leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has said they will not... Um, they won't block the way for Brexit, they will vote for the party line will be to vote Article 50 through. So there are many, many individual MPs finding themselves in an invidious position and it takes us back to classic discussions around what should the role of the representative be? Should they be simply, um, should they be following the party line? Should they be the trustee? So following their own interests and their own views on, as to the best course in the matter or following the the wishes um, of their constituents. And some of them, um, in terms of Labour, have already said they will come out and go against the party line. Um, many of them on the basis actually making a, a delegate kind of an argument, saying they'll follow their constituents. Um, so one Catherine West saying 81% of her constituents voted Remain, therefore she'll go against even the strongest party whip um, from Labour when it comes to legislating Article 50. Others are taking the different view. So the, Jeremy Corbyn's opponent in the Labour leadership battle, most recently Owen Smith, is, is one of the only ones so far who's come out with very much that trustee type of position. He said, 
I was elected to Parliament to exercise my judgment on, on behalf of the people, and I can be ejected by those same people, and that's democracy. So he's come out very clearly saying he'll um, go against the party whip and also against his own constituency because um, he was one of the his, he represents constituencies in Wales around Pontypridd that did vote to leave. So he's one of the only ones so far who's representing a leave constituency who's actually said he'll come out and vote against Article 50 in what he considers to be the better interests of the country as a whole, especially given all of the uncertainties around how the Brexit negotiations will pan out. And just finally, to reflect on some of the issues around holding a referendum, and Campbell already um, referred to this, but I think if we agree, as in, in the ruling parliament is sovereign, we can think about what are the, what's really the utility of holding a referendum, except in the very clearest of terms, or on the, most, on, on the clearest constitutional questions, given the bluntness of the tool. And what um, Amartya Sen was recently in The Guardian was talking about is the one-shot question. So it's all loaded onto the single question. Um, and I think something that the leader of the Liberal Democrats in the UK Parliament said the other day, he said it, the vote in June was a vote for departure from the European Union. It was not a vote for a destination. And I think that t says something quite important about the nature of referendum questions often. Often they're we know what we might not be wanting or we know something about what we're voting but not necessarily what's the nature of what we're voting for. And now as we face um, months or up to two years of negotiations, the content of which the final Brexit deal are very unclear and especially unclear if that is what people thought they were voting for. Um, I think it's a little bit of a cautionary tale about the holding of a referendum. Um, in the absence of very high quality <laughs> public, press, political debate. And as we've seen, and, and Campbell mentioned, the, a little bit, an, an era of rising dem demagoguery around, around the world, that's not necessarily the kind of situation in which we find ourselves um, when we think about holding a referendum. So I'll leave my comments there and look forward to discussing the implications further.